It's the Productize Podcast. I am Brian Castle. It's my show. Thank you for tuning into it. So as we've been doing before we roll today's conversation, which is a good one, you won't want to miss it. We're going to roll the audio from one of my YouTube Q&As. So you can ask any question that you want by replying to any of my email newsletters, and I will answer it over on YouTube. So here's the next one of those. Enjoy. What to work on next? That's a really good question. A lot of options, maybe too many options. How do you get over that analysis paralysis of figuring out what you should work on next? Hi there, Brian Castle here answering another reader question. I really like this one because I I resonate with this one a lot myself. It's something that I can constantly struggle with. So Rob said, my biggest challenge is feeling paralyzed by the amount of options that are available to me you know, what should I work on next? The first thing that I just wanted to say is like, me too. (laughs) I, I, I feel that every single day still. And so over the years, I found that there are a couple of things that helped me break out of that paralysis of figuring out what to do next. Also, what often happens is I, I feel like a sense of regret that I chose to work on the wrong thing when I should have been working on something else instead. So here are four tactics that I've got today. The first is to work backwards from your end goal. I like to think about pretty broad, big goals for the year. And then especially, I really like to focus on like my next 90 days in terms of like the big things that I want to move forward in my business. And I'm talking about specific things that I can control, things that I can create or ship. I'm not talking about, you know, revenue goals. Those are nice to to know, but, you know, sometimes that's a little bit out of our control. I'm talking about like big projects, big rocks that we can move from here to there. So work backwards from your end goal and then break it down into, okay, so I know that 90 days from now, I want my business or these aspects of my business to already be in place. So let's work backwards from that. If that's going to be the end state, what needs to be true here in order for me to even proceed with that? And then how do we work backwards to this week? Okay, well, if I'm going to get here, then what do I need to work on this week? And then you just start to break it down into into smaller and smaller tasks. Then you can kind of assess all those options and figure out, well, which one is going to get me closer to the next mini milestone? Which one has the highest likelihood of, of, of getting me closer? You know, you want to kind of break off the like the 80-20 rule, right? Like the, the, the 20% of things that will move you the farthest. And then that brings me right into number two, and that is to just decide quickly. You're much better off using your gut sense to, to decide on which tasks to bite off next rather than sitting there and waiting and, and trying to overanalyze which one is going to drive the 80% of results. You're not going to be correct every time. You're going to regret working on some things before others. But the more that you do it and the faster that you decide, the more decisions that you make, the better that you're going to get at at making those decisions and the better that you're going to get at prioritizing your work. Number three is to be okay with pushing some pretty high priority things off into the next month or maybe even like the next quarter. You know, that's a really big part of creating space for you to focus on the next thing at hand. You know, right now, literally right now, there are probably three or four huge projects that I really want to get off the ground in the next 90 days. But I'm already accepting that like one or two of those things are just not going to happen in the next 90 days. And I have to be okay with pushing that into, you know, next summer or next fall. That time is going to come around in a few months. And that's when I can reassess after I've already accomplished some other big things. The more you go through this, the more you realize that we've got plenty of time to, to get around to all those other things. And then finally, the last tip, which really helps to see the bigger picture is to review your progress. I always like to look back on the last 30 days to see what did I actually get done this month? And in fact, one one quick tip is to actually write it down, like create a report, an accountability report for yourself. And I strongly suggest that you actually send this report to a few really trusted advisors, trusted friends. So I send this to folks in my mastermind group and sometimes they give me feedback, sometimes they just read it, but it's just a way for me to, to stay accountable. Of Here's everything that I did in the past 30 days. These are the things that I intend to do in the next 30 days. And I can also look back on these um, little reports that I, these, these monthly reports or updates that I send over time and I can see, oh, wow, I actually accomplished a lot over the last six months, you know? And, and, and getting into that practice starts to get yourself more comfortable with the idea of, wow, you can actually accomplish a whole lot in just 30 days. So then that gives you the mentality of it's okay to push some things to the next 30 days because we're going to focus on these right now. And by reviewing, you know, you're, you're becoming aware of your, of your wins, but you're also becoming aware of when you're falling behind. That's what this review also helps to do is like, okay, you said that you were going to try to knock off these big items over the quarter. 
now we're at the end of that quarter and these things didn't get done. So why, why didn't they, they get done? Maybe you can start to reanalyze why you chose to, to make certain decisions. That helps because that's going to better inform your future decisions and when, it com- when it comes to prioritizing what to do next. So I hope that helps. My best tip right now is to shut this off and just get to work on the next thing they have on your list. <laughs> that's like the best thing that you can do right now. No, really, shut it off and get to work right now. Today on the show, I'm talking to Marcin Chirowski. He's the founder of growthturn.com. He shared his story. It was a really good one, how he made that transition from a full-time corporate job to freelancing on Upwork to then building a more structured SEO done-for-you service using the productized service model, of course. And it's really interesting how he used this pay-as-you-go model, kind of a quote-unquote unlimited SEO services month-to-month with a fixed price. And he's actually had clients tell him that that was the reason that, that brought them over the, over the finish line to join and, and become a client. And he's been able to build you know, over a six-figure recurring revenue business, built a team of, of seven people. A really impressive story in, in, a, in a pretty short amount of time. So that was really cool. We got a little bit into the technical side of SEO, especially these days with like machine learning and SEO, which I didn't really know much about. That was really interesting. And Marcin also made some pretty impressive uh, recent adjustments to his positioning and, and messaging on his website, given the, the changes in the business climate here with, with the COVID-19 pandemic. So, uh, so yeah, this was, a, this was a really good one. I think you're going to find some, some pretty interesting tactics. Here's my conversation with Marcin Tarowski. Enjoy. All right, I'm here with Marcin Chirowski from Growth Turn. Marcin, how's it going? Hey, Brian. Thanks for having me. Thanks for having me on the call. Yeah, it's good. It's good. How are you, Brian? Doing good. Doing good. We were just chatting uh, before we, we went on air here. You know, it's always interesting to hear where people are coming from, especially, you know, right now to, you know, here in uh, like the middle of April 2020 when we're recording this. Uh, so where are you based right now? So I'm currently based in Poland, actually, but for many years I was based in London, actually, and then recently come back to here about like two years ago. Yeah, so, so yeah, but most of my professional career I actually spent in, in London, you know, just climbing the corporate ladder, you know, as to say, and then they finally quitting um, in 2017 to start the productized business and then what's called the growth turn. And um, as, as a done for you, then SEO service for B2B SaaS and tech companies actually. Um, so yeah. Yeah, we will. Uh, we'll definitely dig into to all of that. The, the SEO service with, with Growth Turn. I got to say, it's kind of refreshing to be talking to someone. The listeners can't see this, but I'm I'm seeing you on video, and I see you in the background. You you don't have like a home or a home office behind you. You're actually somebody who's out of their home right now, which is like the first that I've seen in weeks. So this is great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's true. That's true. I mean. We do have a luxury of working from home and work remotely. I mean, the the audience, we do appreciate that, especially, you know, nowadays when everybody seems to, like half of the planet is forced to be working from home. But like, um, I was privileged enough to also have the co-working space available, which is I'm calling you from that one at the moment, you know. Very cool. So yeah, growthturn.com is, is your site and service. And it's essentially an SEO service from what I understand, but as, as you were telling me, and, and as I've seen you, you build over the, over the last few months, or I guess it's been more than, more than a few months you've, you've been at this business, but why don't you tell us a little bit more about it? Like what makes your SEO service a little bit unique from say like a typical agency and, and yeah, who are your best clients? Yeah, sure. Um, happy to share that. So yeah, I mean, overall, I've been doing SEO for like, you know, 14 years. So there's nothing new to me, essentially. So I've been doing that for since 2006, really. And then uh, this whole thing started when I, when I quit, you know, it started, first of all, like started freelancing and then quickly realized, okay, I'm just trading time for money. And then I've, I've actually stumbled upon your you know, course and started putting things in place to actually replace, replace the freelancing income with the actual product based services. I'm just curious, like what kind of freelancing work were you doing so like people would just say i need help with seo and you kind of like work on their website a little bit that's it that's it i mean really i mean i when i quit my corporate job i needed to replace my income like straight away i mean i couldn't just kind of wander around i had like mortgage to pay and things like that so i I went on to put myself on upwork and then essentially started freelancing for 
UK, US um, clients, essentially. So that's sort of where I started as a sort of stepping stone. From then onwards, I started to think, okay, I mean, this is not going to be you know, a good, sustainable thing to do. You know, I was just trading time for money, really. I've, I'm sure you, you've heard this from a lot of people who are part of your you know, community. So I started looking, okay, how we can build this. And so it's a productized service. And then, of course, it's not that easy with SEO. I mean, there's so many things that are changing in SEO. Every single year, something is changing. You know, there's, there's new tactics. Google is changing all the time. So a lot of like a classical SEO agencies, you know, they will just uh, take on any client that come and then they'll just ask them, okay, what do you guys need? And they'll start serving them essentially. And so we are not an SEO agency. You know, we essentially, we don't accept uh, all the clients. We are focused on the one new particular niche, mm, which is B2B SaaS and then tech companies. And then we, we productize the service in a way that's like in a unique way, essentially. So we put up the packages on a site, which is not a typical for any agency. You know, typically agencies in SEO will have like a quote, like contact us form on things like that. So they can put like sales process and install like retainer type of situation. In here, we're very clear in terms of the pricing. And we also, what's unique is essentially we're putting a pay-as-you-go model. You know, that's kind of a unique as well. So classically, the SEO agencies will lock the clients in like 12, you know, six or longer contracts. I mean, none of that, uh, none of that is in here. What I've, what I wanted to do is the clients to have the ability to almost like feel like you, they're working with the freelancer, but it, it's not like, like, work. it's like working with it's more like a productized you know, service. So essentially, it's somewhere in between. You know, What kind of sticks out to me is, is this idea that you have on your pricing section on your website, where it's basically like you get a block of 60 hours per month or 30 hours per month, depending on the plan. And then it says unlimited SEO support. Can you tell us like what that means? And like, I'm curious, like month to month, because I'd imagine there must be some probably a lot of work to be done in the first month, like auditing and fixing a bunch of problems and then what's kind of like the ongoing yeah what goes into those hours absolutely absolutely so so what i did is essentially you know when i was actually putting this together i've looked at the entire seo as a program i've started to break this down into smaller pieces and then once i was just chopping this off uh, i come up with a rough idea of how long things take and i put them into like hourly brackets that's why I've put the hourly packages there because it was easier for clients to understand how much they're getting. Because on the on the monthly month basis, we take on like a step by step approach, and the certain things take X amount of time. So let's take an example like the keyword research. And for the typical clients that we work with, it's typically taking about twenty hours to do. And um, so in that thirty hours that we sell in our packages. We give them a keyword research to start with, and then something else that actually fits that plan. So that's the that's the thirty hour, you know, sort of a differentiator in terms of the packaging. Yeah, and like I've been doing, like you know, with SEO, I, I feel like it's one of those things that's a little bit like a black box to people who who don't do the work of SEO themselves. And and I've never really been an SEO expert or specialist, but I've I've tried to like read up on it over the years and do a little bit of it myself on my own sites. And, and like right now I'm doing a little bit of work on the productize, uh, the product has scale site to try to improve some of that SEO. And, and I'm going through the work of like keyword research and opening up my Ahrefs account and my Google analytics and search console. And especially as like a non expert in this, it's, it's hard and it is time consuming. It's not, it's not just like clicking a button and you get a report of, keywords it's like you have to actually analyze them and do some competitive research and stuff yeah absolutely absolutely and especially these days when google is all about relevance it's all about like really displaying the the most like accurate results at the top so so yeah definitely it's not easy to do overall and that's why when we take the clients i mean we reject over like 300 invites project invites in last year we take the clients who actually understand the value in terms of the, the SEO and the, the services we provide, because then it will be easier for us to work with them in the long term, which we want, which essentially we, that's essentially what we want to, to work with them in the long term, 
I definitely want to get into that. You, you, you mentioned that you reject a lot of the, the client projects. We'll get into like the sales and, and vetting process uh, in a little bit here. Can you give us like a sense of, of a size of your company? I don't know whether it's revenue or your team size and, and like any like sense of context. Sure, sure. Yeah, yeah, sure. Happy, happy to share that, of course. So, I mean, last year, the business generated over like 110 um, K. US dollars and in a peak month we did like a 15k per month and so I mean for most people you know that are doing business it's not that much you know but for me it's actually quite a big deal you know as I managed to move away from the trading time for money you know from the classical freelancing and then I showed really to myself that I actually I actually build the business does essentially be on me so so yeah that's kind absolutely of- first of all that's not a small amount of, of revenue but but still, as as you're saying, it's to me that that's always been the biggest win. It's not like a the biggest win to me is not like some some big exit or some big you know huge revenue number. It's it's the fact that you've proven that this model can can work. Like you, you've proven that an ability to make any revenue at a recurring model that is not tied to your personal billable hours, and and then that's like something that that. That you've proven to yourself that you can build on and, and scale, right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And then that's the that was the whole point. When I have actually joined the productized community, this was my main goal, essentially to step away for trading time, time for money. When we talk at, at this time, we the team is like seven. It's the seven of us, a fully remote team. And then, I mean, the core SEO team and it sort of consists of five people, essentially. So it's um. I'm still a lot connected to sort of the operations, but I'm trying to step away as much as possible. And then we've got the, a team leader who doing the day-to-day operations. So managing the team and then making sure the goals of the clients are achieved. Then we've got the manager and the, the outreach specialist the, and then the support person. And there's, and there's my wife helping with the finances, you know? So yeah, that's, um, that's kind of the, the team size at this moment. Very nice. Very nice. So, you, so my understanding is, again, like SEO is kind of like that black box of just trying to figure out like who's actually doing what. So you've got some managers who are in charge of like, like milestones and, and tracking the, everybody's tasks. But then you have kind of like some technicians who are more like in the, in the analysis, in the spreadsheets. Absolutely. So I've tried to structure the team like a, like a pod almost like, I mean, I mean, I've heard a lot of that in the you know, podcast that I was listening to. Uh, that people refer to as, you know, just creating uh, the pods. So that's kind of what we're trying to do now. And then in this current state, almost like we have, if I feel like we have one pod, which we then need to go to the having a second uh, before we scale up and replicate this. You know, that's interesting you, you bring that up with pods. It, it's something that I tried to do early on in audience ops. Like we do it to a certain extent where where a single client gets a dedicated account manager and a writer and a copy editor and an assistant. They're basically communicating with the account manager, but on our end, we assign those four people to a client so that at least for that one client, those same four people do it week to week for a long time. But then early on, I, me and my team manager were thinking about doing like, okay, these four people always work on the same clients together and they're a pod. And then these other four people, always, and for whatever reason that didn't quite work like we still mix and match where like different managers will work with different writers across different accounts we just try to always match the same people to the same clients if that makes sense i think it's hard to manage individual per- people's workloads you know so like we can add a client to pod a but but pod b two of those people might have a lot of availability in pod a like some of them might already be full in terms of their personal hours so yeah I mean, it's like business, you know, it it's never ends. I mean, the optimization and this kind of like rejiggling things never ends really, to be honest. So then thanks to our advice, definitely will take that on, you know, because it's, I mean, it's not perfect. I mean, I didn't figure out everything, you know, from day one. So it's all like always kind of changing, you know? Yeah, yeah, for sure. But I mean, this is the kind of stuff, it's like boring to most of the world, but it's it's fascinating to me because it's like, once you figure out these formulas of like people and roles and systems, you know, it's 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 like a formula that you can just replicate and grow and multiply. You know, yeah, yeah, definitely. That's that's definitely what I'm looking for. Actually, so I'm curious about like 
the transition. You mentioned that you were doing some freelance work on Upwork, which I also think is a really great place to start. A lot of people kind of, I don't know, like frown upon Upwork or whatever. But when you're coming from a corporate job and you just need to get your very first clients, it's like it's a whole website full of clients. So, you know, it's it's a good, uh, definitely a good place to start. But like, how did you start to do that transition? Like, what were your very first steps to say, like, okay, I'm gonna, you know, try to phase out the hourly stuff on Upwork and start to take the first steps to making this a real business. Yeah, uh, absolutely. So, I mean, back in 2017, when I, when I sort of finally decided to quit, I mean, it was pretty quite scaring at the beginning, you know, but really turned up to be one of the best decisions I might, you know. So then I turned into Upwork, like you say, you know, for some people, it's not the best place to, you know, to be around. I mean, but for me, it was the quickest way of actually, you know, getting an income. You know, after quitting the job, it was pretty much like came straight away because then just building up the profile there allowed me to actually get the, a quick stream of uh, of income. And so that was why I've decided to go there and then sort of build up a profile from from there. And then it sort of quickly sort of I quickly realized, you know, that there was so much sort of work available, you know, that I, I couldn't just do everything by myself. It was just it was impossible, you know. So I was literally trading time for money, actually. And then I was raising rates, you know, up to certain percent, into certain points, until the client, the, the the invoice stopped coming, essentially. But uh, they've been still coming. So at a certain point, I sort of realized, I mean, this is it cannot go on like this, you know. It, even though if I put the higher rate uh, per hour. I'm still training the the hours because it's just for the higher rate essentially. Uh, so that's where I sort of started looking around what's available in terms of like building this as a product, and then sort of that's why I sort of look at the um, possible ways of productizing this. You know, I didn't have that word in my mind at the time. You know, I didn't know what the productization is, but I was actually following you on the on the Bootstrap web and listening to you on the podcast there. And then I sort of heard at one of the podcasts that you're launching the course. And then on one of the iterations of the course, I actually went on. And then, you know, I sort of started getting into the framework, like how you, you know, how you structure things. And then I started building the, the business around it. When did you start to like reach out to clients or, get, or work with clients that were not through Upwork? And how did you make those first connections? Yeah, so essentially, you know, believe it or not, I still have clients coming from Upwork, you know, so that's also interesting. It's a great like lead gen channel, right? It's a lead gen channel, essentially, you know, for because I've built the profile there. And then anybody who's looking for SEO services, they might consider Upwork as a source of uh, potential, you know, potential good candidates to, to consider. And, and, because we are not an agency and we're not, you know, we're kind of in between. So when they see me up there, you know, they, they often sort of reach out and then we start to have a conversation and then the sales process starts really from there. You know, so believe it or not, there's still quite a lot of customers that are coming to us these days are coming from Upwork, you know, because they're huge. They actually get a really large presence on on search engines and then yeah that's that's the way we actually get the most of the clients these days plus some of the connections that we built over time you know some uh, some of the presence online and then you know i did some speaking on the conferences and things like that but then hmm. it wasn't that successful to be turning into the clients as much as the platform itself you know because then you show up on a conference you know i did few of them and then uh, people really enjoy what you do uh, and then what you sort of tell them or the conference. But then at that time, most of these people who, you know, go to the conference, they don't have the immediate need to buy your services. So when they actually do, they will turn up to places like, uh, to places like Upwork or just straight Google it. Right. And now more, more recently, uh, quite a few clients are going to places like um, Get Credo as well. Uh, from John, yep. uh, who's also a bit really good marketplace, you know, for agencies and and clients who come together, because these places are like a vetted place uh, where the clients can see, you know, the testimonials from past clients and then 
can really sort of see you before you starting, you know, before they start engaging with you. Yeah, uh, I mean, what what John Doherty has built over at Get Credo is is, is really pretty cool. It's as, as you said, it's like a, I guess it's like a very curated marketplace, specifically, I think, specializing in SEO agencies. And uh, yeah, that's been pretty solid. Just a minute to tell you about Process Kit. If your operation needs to become more efficient and more predictable so that your team never lets anything fall through the cracks, then it's time to implement Process Kit. Process Kit is process driven project management software made for powering client services businesses. It's especially designed with productized services in mind. Create powerful SOPs with built in if this then that automations and then use those processes to power all of your repeatable projects. Whether you're managing a pipeline of new clients onboarding to your service, or tracking weekly deliverables, sales proposals, marketing assets, or admin work, Process Kit is your team's place for getting it all done, but more importantly, done right. Use our powerful Zapier integration to hook Process Kit into all of your other systems. And if you'd like expert help with improving your processes and automations, ask about our Process Kit implementer service. Request your free demo and trial at processkit.com. So, you know, one thing that I, I noticed on your website, what I, well, what I also love about it is that it's like very simple. It's basically like a one page website. I think you have maybe two or three pages. Yeah. But the main thing is like, you know, about us and, and the, uh, and I also really like your top headline here that, that stuck out to me. It said, secure your business future with cost efficient SEO that work. Like, I just like that, that idea of like secure your business future. And especially right now when everybody's business feels pretty insecure. <laughs> yeah. That just really kind of resonated right there. Thank you. Thank you. I mean, yeah, I mean, this is one of the uh, two main things I'm focusing on this year, really, to be honest. And then because the, the future is also uncertain, I've actually changed this headline very recently. Um, and then previously it was saying, grow your business with the SEO that works. But now I want, I needed to adjust the messaging and then focus much more on saving costs versus making money. These days, businesses will be looking much more to sustain their, you know, their actual businesses and then uh, looking for cost efficient solutions, essentially, instead of growing in revenue, you know, growing in revenue. So I had to adjust, I had to adjust the messaging. And then the same as saying to the clients as well, I, I need to adjust the messaging because of what's happening in the currently. That's really smart. I, I mean, I, I applaud you just making those changes so quickly. You know, that's, it's something that I've been thinking about, like, how should I change my messaging? And especially on, over on Process Kit, which is a little bit more like a remote, it is used for remote working. And I should emphasize the, the fact that it's a remote working tool since that's, that sort of resonates a little bit more. But I haven't gone and taken any action on that yet. It's just like <laughs> another thing on the to-do list. Yeah, Absolutely. The other fear that I usually have, especially when the business has been around for a while, is like, I'm, I'm afraid of changing anything. You know, like, I feel like if I change one word, like conversions are going to stop or something. And I, you know. <laughs> <laughs> that's true. That's true. So the, the site you've been uh, referring to is like one pager, really. It's one pager. And I haven't changed it for like uh, at least like a year and a half. And then uh, it's kind of same with true what you're saying in terms of like, you know, you shouldn't be changing that much. Uh, but we do, I mean, we do, I've been, you know, last year I did the new branding and we're going to look at the new site. I mean, so the business definitely need to be, you know, uh, you know, constantly changed as we go on, you know, and that's, that's just natural, you know? Yeah, for sure. The other thing that, that stuck out to me as I was looking through your website is you have this guide here on machine learning, and I guess you, you've done some speaking on this or a presentation and this just seemed interesting to me, partly because I have no idea what it all means. <laughs> but that's kind of what's interesting is like when I think about SEO, I don't necessarily link it to my understanding of what machine learning is. Can you give us like a maybe like a brief overview of what you're talking about here and and like why that's important to think about in terms of SEO? And and to me, it, it's it just seems like it's a unique perspective or more of like a cutting edge way of looking at SEO, which sort of differentiates you from the thousands upon thousands of SEO providers out there. Sure, sure. So yeah, I mean, machine learning is a subject I was giving a talk, you know, back in 2017. And it's really, you know, it's really one of the things that Google is introducing, introduced a while back. 
and then they want to know as much as possible about us and our, our behavior. And so they, of course, they hire robots for that and the machines to actually learn and as much as possible about our behavior online. And then uh, what they say improved the rankings, but in most cases is actually to improve the ad revenue essentially. But we do help clients with advanced things like, like that. And then there are a couple of things you could do to not necessarily like trick the bot or trick the machine, but actually, you know, make it believe that your, your site is more sticky, that it's more engaging. And there, are, you know, there's things like, you know, a click rate optimization or, or things like a bounce rate or, or stickiness optimization. Just looking at your, you know, top converting sort of pages and making sure they are the most sort of like the sticky ones that customers stay on. And uh, that's sort of the way to not necessarily trick the machine, but also optimize for it, you know, in as much as possible. Got it. So my understanding of that is is that Google is is far beyond our basic understanding of optimization, right? Like, you know, we we all and of course it's still important to make sure that the words on your page align with search keywords and and things like that, and that you're using the right site structure, but the content and matching from the search, the searcher's intent to what's on your site, like Google is able to track when somebody searches for this thing, clicks a link, do they bounce or do they stay around or do they browse multiple pages? And if you can, if your site can achieve that goal, then it's playing into the bot who is kind of identifying that behavior. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. That's essentially how the machine is, how the machine is learning. You know, so you're looking at our behavior and then if we do engage with the sites, and we don't turn back to Google to search again, they do emphasize that and then prioritize the sites to go up in rankings because of that. You know, so essentially they do that essentially to improve the rankings, but in, in some extent it, it is helping, but it makes it super difficult for, for us as SEO professionals to actually do that to the job that we used to do. But so essentially we, we have a set of tactics, you know, which do work and get a good result for the clients. But um, the industry is changing so fast, then, you know, it's, yeah, it's just fascinating. Interesting. Let's talk a little bit more about your sales process. You mentioned that you get all these leads, whether they're from Upwork or, or from other, other channels, and you said that, that you reject some of them. Like, how do you go through and vet them? Like, what does the sales process look like? Sure. So... I'm trying to simplify as much as possible the, the sales process. So after I got like initial, you know, initial contact from a prospect of clients, then the, the, the vetting really starts uh, there because essentially I need to see if they actually could fit for us. You can judge that. You can see it from straight away. Uh, you know, most of the companies we work are small and medium, you know, SaaS uh, companies uh, in US, UK or Western Europe. I mean, there's, there's quite a, quite a big filter there actually and then so we reject a lot of like sort of local shops or anything to do which doesn't just fit that niche essentially because we essentially we not cater for them you know so that's a large filter there so local businesses that only serve a, a local area you're not doing any any sort of local seo no 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 yeah otherwise it wouldn't be productized services for the specific audience it yeah. will be and just that, and local priced. SEO seems like a completely different game than that's it. Like that's it. It's just completely the whole thing, you know. So there might be services which uh, do cater for the local specific or or e-commerce. Let's say they they focus on just e-commerce SEO, uh, and it's perfectly fine because then we just pick the different niche, and that's essentially like a bit large filter that we've applied in here. And that's sort of the starting of the vetting process starts there essentially by defining the audience that we serve. You know, so that's the that's the start starting process. And then once I do have a, you know, I start typically start with the call. You know, I'll actually the entire sales process is online. You know, so if you imagine, then like I'm not even you know my English is is my second language. You know, and I'm trying to sell expensive product online without even seeing the person, without being actually shaking a hand, you know, without physically seeing them. So as you can imagine, the sales process needs to be 
really good and then needs the connection between uh, the person who's selling the service and then the, who's trying to buy the, the service and needs to be really as much human as possible. So I'm not trying to force anything on people, like trying to any salesy tactics, anything like that. I'm just trying to be as, uh, you know, as friendly as possible. And then at the same time, selling the services, presenting them, you know, showing the results. When you say it's like all online, like, so I see on your website, there's like a consultation form. They fill that out. Sorry, actually, that, that goes to your Calendly. That's it. And then, so you do have like a, like a call, like a Zoom call like or whatever. Call. With them. Yeah, that's it. That's it. I'll, uh, I use Zoom for the initial course and all the other course afterwards, essentially. So um, typically, I jump on the call with the person. And then we see if it's a good fit, then we pretty much see instantly, you know. And then it's really sort of like... Are you looking for anything like on their website? Like, do you do any sort of like pre audit to see like okay there are things that we, that we know we could fix on their website yeah 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 absolutely so yeah, we've got all the tools that essentially can tell us pretty much anything about the website you know these days all the SEO people that have professional tools that are, you can just take the any website and just plug it in and you will know it and within like five minutes if it's a good or not uh, so that that's definitely sort of part of the vetting process to see if we can actually help them you know, mm-hmm. yeah. So then, after the initial call, you know, after the initial call, uh, pretty much I have some most most like like a standard like proposal, you know, sort of. But it's not like it's not so much a custom proposal, you know. They're uh, classical as agencies will send you like you know sort of customized proposal. In my my proposal is more it is there because there are expensive services. You know, I could just put like a buy now button online. Yes, I could. But then I sort of, I mean, I might be wrong as well. You know, then I'm just thinking when they have something physical, like a, yeah, to show to the boss or to show to somebody else to forward, hey, these guys are real, then it sort of more verifies that it's, it's go ahead, you know. So I got one client, for example. And also the other thing is that uh, the pay-as-you-go model, that's it's one of the key in here because I've got one client from Barcelona, they do chatbots. And then essentially after the sales process, he told me your pay-as-you-go model is just made so much easier for us to make the decision because we didn't need to commit. It was just so simple to try. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. And I, I like the point there about having like a PDF or is, is it a PDF, the proposal? It is. Yeah, it is. Yeah. That's really cool because like, you know, yeah, it's it's easy to have a buy buy now button on the website, but it, I, I run into that so many times where I talk to a person on a sales call and they're like, okay, let me run it by my boss or let me run it by my, my business partner. And they just need something to to show them to give them like kind of like a rundown so that they don't have to like explain everything that that we talked about. Yeah. Yeah, that could be very, very helpful. Yeah, and that that's the, really the whole process. And then and then we just have a simple ready to go ahead, you know, at the end. And then we start the onboarding. We start the onboarding process afterwards once they decide to go ahead. And then when you go into onboarding, so somebody has signed up, paid for their first month, what happens then? Like, do you hand it off to your team and they do the kickoff call and things like that? So yeah, and, and then uh, once we start onboarding, I try to involve the team as much as possible. So yeah, definitely. I mean, but I still need to be there because I was the sales, I was quote unquote the salesperson and then the founder. So at this very moment, we kind of, we at this stage where it's sort of like, it's still small, you know, it's not like um, a huge SEO agencies with like, you know, account manager upon account manager. So that's why, you know, we haven't yet like built like a massive structure. So in some ways, I still need to be quite close to customers when it comes to actually the communication side of things, you know, but yes, I definitely want to get as much as people uh, in place after the, the sales process is, you know, is done. Very cool. Very cool. So what have you sort of learned? Like, I, I know that you you made that transition from kind of general like hourly billing into into building a, a team and and making this a, a recurring, you know, fixed rate, you know, monthly service. And that that's pretty awesome. Like, what else have you learned maybe in terms of like your operations, you know, like an aha moment that just 
kind of clicked and made made things easier for you? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. That's a good question. I mean, there there was so many things. You know, there's there's so many things. Like on a daily basis, there's something new coming up. Right. I think the biggest things that I'm you know fo- focusing on right now is, is systems. Really, that's huge for me. And then I'm trying as much as possible to to put things in place. And then working on that, it, it was a big sort of aha moment for me in terms of like scaling and then you know the the whole the whole thing and then making sure that the things work beyond me essentially so it's not perfect and i'm assuming it's never going to be perfect because of the nature of things and how quickly they they change essentially but then i'm i'm trying to as much as to you know productize this um, so what what i did essentially i've mapped out the the entire a service, a map of the entire service delivery, and I call this the the GT method, you know, from the growth term. You know, so it really, it's the SEO process that anybody you know else is doing. But we've we've added like um, a SaaS specific, the audience specific, uh, the things in that method. And then once we have that defined, it's easy to tell the clients like, okay, this is the way we're gonna work together over the coming months. And then we started breaking this down into phases and into individual steps, you know. So that was. I mean, I, yeah. I mean, I, I think you nailed it. Like the, the the whole idea is to take what you do and and turn it into your own methodology and document it so that you yourself don't don't need to be the person doing it, and it makes it a more, a more predictable delivery for the client. And they don't, the client doesn't need to even make the decisions. It's it's like it's built into your best possible method, right? Yeah. Yeah, that's it. I mean, that's the that's the way we're trying to go. Of course, there's a lot of you know customization and variables in SEO, but then uh, as they come, uh, we try to move them back to the actual methods that we operate in. You know, so let's say the clients they need more content. You know, most of most of the clients they will be needing the content to actually run their SEO. So we've got the Parts of the method is actually, you know, finding what sort of content um, types we should be producing. You know, there's, there's things like pillar pages or the content hubs, and then we've got um, pretty fine sort of like procedures of how to research those and how to put those uh, sort of analysis together. And that's essentially how we are trying to break this method into the specific action items, which are which then could be turned into the SOPs. And then the templates, you know, so I've used the, your uh, template catalog, you know, from the course, from the course. Very cool. And then I started sort of mapping some core, core SOPs then, then, and then constantly improving them, you know. So the first one was, of course, the keyword research. And then uh, we, we keep on adding the new ones, of course, you know, but then I think this is, these days is a good time to look at those things. When it comes to, you know, the business, it's really pretty much clear to everybody that we're going to go into this slow time, you know, in terms of the businesses and then things like that. So looking internally, how we can improve things internally, how we can improve the operations and the systems, it could be really good thing to do now. Well, that was actually going to be my my last question here is, you know, coming back to the current climate that we're in. What are some of those adjustments that you're thinking about? It sounds like you're you're looking more internally, going to improve the operations. You also mentioned how you, you changed the copy on the website a little bit to, to speak more to like solving the pain and and cost savings rather than growth. Anything else that you're that you're looking at uh, changing or adapting this year? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. There's there's so many things going outside of our control these days. I mean, this whole this whole outbreak is definitely going to be more bigger, much bigger than all of us expecting to be, essentially. Uh, so what I'm looking at right now is like like the couple main things, you know. So first of all, like keeping the existing clients happy and adding as much as value as possible. You know, so that's what we decided that we're gonna focus on the existing clients to make sure they are seeing the best results possible and they staying with us for longer. You know, so really sort of Making sure they don't cancel and then, you know, that we can sustain the business. So that's, that's one thing. 
Um, the second, uh, as you mentioned, is adjusting the value proposition, you know, just to make sure they understand that actually it's more sort of like investment, you know, if, uh, rather than like, you know, just a, a simple cost. And then I really also the third thing um, and last uh, these days I'm focusing on is trying to encourage the client to to pass through all of this that's happening at this moment, you know, because I'm really believing in then there is going to be a word after this whole thing is over. Yeah. So the smart, uh, smart businesses, smart clients should be thinking already ahead of times what's going to happen after this whole thing is over. And the ones that are going to be making smart investments now, they will be much faster in terms of the recovery, in terms of the growth after this whole thing is over. The ones that's going to cut the cost like to the bare bones and uh, they are the ones who are going to be need to scramble back into the normal levels. You know, so that's why I'm trying to say to all the clients that we should be working together as a, it's a cost affecting long term investment that you're making in your business. You know? Yeah. Yeah. That's a really, really good point. Well, uh, well, Marcin, this is really great. Um, it's been, it's been really awesome to kind of follow your story over these last uh, couple of years with, with growth turn. We're going to get that linked up in the show notes. Is, is there anywhere else people can connect with you? Thank you. No, it's all good. I think it's all good. They'll, they'll find it. They'll, they'll find it if they want to hear more. I'm happy to help um, you know, to all your listeners. Anybody needs support in these days, I'm happy to support you know, and then offer any like, free advice to, to the, the things that people struggle with. So yeah, happy to help. Awesome. Well, uh, well yeah. Thanks, Marcin. Cool. Thank you. Thanks for having me. All right. Did that give you something to think about? If it did, let me know on Twitter. I'm at CastJam. If you want to find show notes on this or any of the other episodes or my weekly newsletter with new content, head over to productizeandscale.com. Now, if you haven't already, a five-star review in iTunes, that would go a long way to helping other folks find the show. Thanks for tuning in. I'll see you next time.